Welcome back to the Family Movie Night Podcast, where we want to help you and your family have better conversations around the content you consume. This is episode 61, and we're back. Now, I will say it probably doesn't feel like we're back to those of you uh, who just watched episode 60 last week. Uh, But for those of us here on the podcast, it's been almost an entire month since we have filmed. Though We did a bunch of work before the holidays to get ahead and we are uh, we are back. Uh, uh, sadly, uh, we are down a co-host in that uh, uh, the mom of our podcast, Heidi Cooper, had to take some time uh, off from the podcast. And so uh, she she needed to uh, step away uh, for, for her own needs. And so uh, we are still trudging along. And uh, I just want to hear from Donnie Dorsey, uh, the uh, not only the hero of our podcast, but the dad. One of, one, of, one of the dads on this podcast. Donnie, how you doing, man? How, how, how you doing? How are your holidays? How, how are holidays for, for the hero of the podcast? I'd say if I were to grade my holidays, it was probably, uh, it was a strong B plus, uh, almost an A, but uh, I'd say uh, made the most of the, most of the good and the, uh, in uh, worked through the, the challenging part. So it was, I enjoyed it. Go. I enjoyed it. And I'll say, and for the movie we're talking about today, man, you get to be one of the best heroes. Is this the first time that we've had a Denzel Washington character on this podcast? Have we talked about Denzel Washington before this? But regardless, you get to be Denzel Washington to get today as the hero of this podcast. How are you feeling, Donnie? I feel good about that. I feel I feel like I get to like it. It shows that I have a lot of lot to give, much like That's Denzel right. did in this movie. So that's right. I like that. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Of course, we have the villain of our podcast who normally I make horrendous things, but I won't do that today. Here's what I'm going to do for you, Sawyer. You're going to be the driver of the car that paralyzes Gary Bertier in this I'll movie. I'll take it. I'll take it. Because <laughs> there's a lot worse this villains in this there's movie. There's a lot worse villains in this movie. I'll take the negligent driver that hits Gary Bertier, okay? Very good. Uh, Sawyer, though, I do. I do want to hear what what were your holidays like though, man? You got to go back home to Missouri for a, for yeah. a, a little over a week. How was that? Yeah, it was nice. It was really nice to just be home with family. Um, I would I would give my Christmas a solid A. It was uh, really just an Ooh, excellent time. Taking to down Donnie's B plus A minus. <laughs> hey, you know, hey, he set the grading precedent. Okay, I didn't. I I wouldn't have done that. Okay, I would have. You can't I had a great see this set. on on either podcast, but Donnie's eyeball got so close to the camera, it I couldn't didn't see him move towards the camera, but his eyeball, in an intense fashion to intimidate Sawyer, got so close to the camera, he looked like that squid monster from Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is a good Very holiday good. though. Very good. Very good. Well, hey, we don't just talk about holidays on this podcast, although I will say uh, today's uh, podcast, today's movie is uh, inspired by the upcoming holiday of uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s uh, birthday, the the Martin Luther King Day. So uh, let's before we get into any of that, let's talk about uh, what we do on this podcast. So Donnie Dorsey, tell them what do we do? On this podcast, we encourage every family at Community Christian Church to have a monthly movie night to help you and your children build memories, start conversations that matter. The goal of our family ministry is to help you raise your children to love Jesus and his way of life above all other things. And we know that critical to that is for you to have a routine, regular time of connection and shared experiences that will help you build stronger relationships. And uh, on this podcast, we want to not only recommend some movies you can watch on your monthly movie night, but give you some ideas of meaningful conversations you could have with your children during or after the movie. And as always, the point of this podcast is not to add another thing to your list as a parent you feel guilty about not doing. We want to make it easier for you and your kids to enjoy being together so you can build memories and have conversations that matter. And we think we have a great movie to help you do that. Uh, As I mentioned, we are uh, coming up on this Monday, as of the podcast being released, is Martin Luther King uh, Jr. Day, which uh, we often think of as kind of being uh, an American holiday. But I think it's really important for those of us uh, who follow Jesus to remember. uh, And I think Dr. King would say this of himself, that before he was an American, uh, he was a pastor, a follower of Jesus. And so this is uh, not really just uh, an American holiday. It really is a time for those of us who follow Jesus 
Jesus uh, to be able to honor someone who showed us what following Jesus in the public sphere looked like, uh, taking a stand for justice and equality and uh, for God's love to be seen. And we're going to talk more about that. But the movie we're talking about today, we think is a great opportunity to kind of talk about the work of Dr. King and really um, greater. We'll get into this into themes. Uh, what Dr. King was trying to create and what he often spoke of as the beloved community, which he really saw as this the, a church uh, that really is united and reconciled across racial, uh, economic uh, all kinds of dividing lines. And that really is not just a vision of, you know, Dr. King had a dream, uh, but Jesus was the first one uh, who had this vision. Uh, and really when he created humanity and the movie we're talking about is probably one that most of you have seen. It is uh, called remember the Titans. This is from uh, the year 2000. I believe I don't have it pulled up, but um, I remember seeing this movie in theaters. Uh, if you have watched any cable television, uh, in the last 23 years, you've probably watched this multiple times. It is a, a great syndication bump. This is from Walt Disney uh, Studios and stars Denzel Washington and Will Patton uh, as just uh, two coaches who are leading a football team. I believe, I didn't look this up, but I believe it's the first integrated football team in Virginia. I believe that's correct. I know it's the first, uh, it's about integration in the, uh, of integrating the schools uh, in uh, Virginia, and uh, Coach Boone, played by Denzel Washington, and uh, who is the name of the coach, played by Will Patton? Someone look it up. And no, it. I've got it pulled up. Anyway, like they're integrating the team, and uh, it's about their perfect season of football. So, uh, I don't probably need to tell you that, though, because you know this movie. Yost. Heard of Yost coach coach Yost. Yost, played by Will Patton. So, I don't really even want to recommend this to people, because You've already seen it. Now, I will say, I will recommend, if you've got young kids like mine, you may not think about this movie because it is close to, it's about to be a classic movie. It's almost 25 years old. That's nuts. But uh, I, I just want to talk about what, what does this movie mean to us? Because all of us have seen it. Um, and uh, we've probably seen it the last 23 years on repeat. So I just want to open it up to Donnie Dorsey, the hero of our podcast, Coach Boone himself, Denzel Washington, what do you feel about this movie, man? What, what does this movie mean to you? I think this movie, like, um, and I, we were talking about this a little bit earlier. I, I think this movie is by far a classic. I think it's gets all the stars, all the deserves all the accolades because it does a great job of navigating a very complicated topic in, in very earnest ways, because I yes. think, a lot of times when people navigate like the topic of race and the topic of like the divide and what it looked like, they often like either tread really, really lightly or they go a little far and it makes people overly uncomfortable. I think this makes can make people just the amount of uncomfortable to see what what it was trying to accomplish. And like, yes. I think it's I think it's a movie that it's so well done that. Like I was telling uh, Sawyer a little bit ago, I said, I still am heavily invested every time some of the scenes happen, even though I know the outcome, I still yes. get like riled up. Like when they're about like all the things happening, I'm, I'm like cheering in the morning and with the things like with the, the car accident, I'm like, oh no. And I'm like, it's just, yeah. I, I ten, totally ten, agree. All the stars. <laughs> Yes, Denzel, we were talking about this too before. I think this is one of Denzel's best performances, which is really hard to categorize. It's really like when someone's like, I think this is one of Steven Spielberg's best movies. Or like when you say, this is Michael Jackson's best song, you know? <laughs> like when yeah. you get down, like, oh, how do you know? How do you know? You know, there's so many, but this really does show like the full range of what Denzel can do. He's funny. He's incredibly sincere. He has these moments where he goes from like, intense like passion and i will say are there any like screaming denzel there are really good screaming denzel but i don't think there are in this he's passionate in this movie but i don't think we get one of those and we don't get like a him crying moment which denzel can cry better than almost anybody but you yeah. definitely get these like high passion to really quiet and intense yeah. moments that's just i mean that's just patented denzel right there so i i agree uh sawyer hewlett uh, I know we were talking about this before. Do you consider this the best football movie of all time? Is there a better oh, football movie oh, than this? this? Like, you know, Rudy is great. I love Rudy. I want to be agree. Great. But I think 
there is a depth that this movie reaches in turn. And like, I'm not even talking about just in terms of its themes, but like in terms of like balancing character arcs and stuff like that, Rudy is like hyper-focused on one character and everyone else basically doesn't matter. Um, you know, there are some good side characters. There's the janitor at the state at the stadium that uh, I can't even remember his name. But this movie is just so freaking good at balancing all the characters. You know, w- like Denzel is just clearly like leading them, and you feel like you're like being led with the other characters. Is the thing almost? That's like what I what yeah. I feel like in the movie is. I feel like when Julius and Gary are like working their issues out together and being led by these coaches. I feel like I'm just right in there with them to a certain extent. Yeah. Um, and, and I think that's just to the movie's charm almost. That's the best way that I can put it. Cause like there's just something to be said about the charisma of Denzel Washington. There's like a level to which like I, I would follow that man into any battle is the thing. And I feel like <laughs> this movie really cashes in on that that aspect you were talking about how he's really good at being passionate and quiet at the same time or throughout the same throughout this movie and like there's a level to which i'm like yeah like anyways we were talking earlier this movie is also really funny is the thing and that's something that like i value a lot because there's a level to which like if you were going to be like a somber movie you're gonna have to like get me in the door somehow and this movie is really good at doing that because it it would be easy for this movie to, to get um very um just like focused on one thing with the really serious stuff but the fact that it's allow- able to deflate a little bit in moments allows me as the audience member to get comfortable with the movie with the characters so that then when Denzel wakes all the players up at 4:30 in the morning and they run to Gettysburg Battlefield that's like an extremely impactful moment because of what they've done to get me endeared to these characters when a fight breaks out or when uh, coach Boone embarrasses some of the players in front of all their parents and stuff like that. It's, it's just really, really well done. And I, I love basically every second of this movie, this movie, this movie kind of rules. I agree. Yeah. That the pacing of it is amazing. Like, like you said, I mean, they pace it so well because I think in any movie, a great movie, like you have to give me time to care and you have to give me time to deal with the emotion that you're putting in front of me. And like the pacing of it is just impeccable. Well, and I'll say, so I agree. I think this is the best football movie of all time. Um, I, I, I quickly, while Sawyer was talking, uh, Googled the best football movies of all time. Rolling Stone did a, a, a one on this and they put, remember the Titans is five. They put some movies above it. The only one above it that I will say Probably. And what I mean by best football movies of all time is not movies that feature football uh, because Jerry Maguire is a really good movie that was on the list. It's a really good movie that has football in it, but it's not a football movie. What I particularly mean is movies that shoot football games as a sport, football as a sport in dramatic ways like the dramatic like you care you actually care about who wins this game like you're invested in what's happening um friday night lights is the only one that comes close to being a movie that's about a football game and you actually care what's going on and they shoot it in pretty cinematic ways but i think this is still better uh i think it's i think the football is the the action is very clear in a way mm-hmm. that I'll say the Friday Night Lights does not shoot the action that way in ways that irritate me beyond belief. Uh, but that is my gripes with Peter Berg as a director. But uh, the the way that these things are uh, shot, it's clear. It's emotional. He finds ways to slow down the action of uh, the director of this uh, uh, movie, um, uh, Boaz. I don't know how you say his last name. Yakin or Yakin or I don't know how you say his last name, but um Anyway, he directs it in such a way that the scenes are done well. Uh, We were talking before. I believe there are two sports that are really good cinematic sports. Boxing, we mentioned. A lot of really good boxing movies. um, And baseball. I think baseball is the best team sport uh, to be filmed because baseball, like boxing, kind of comes down to like Western uh, duels at the OK Corral. It's 
pitcher versus catcher in boxing, same things, two guys. And you have these teams and you have these moments like in boxing where they can go back and kind of talk to their coach and get back in. Same thing with baseball. You can slow it down and you can really slow down the moments. Basketball, though, it is my favorite sport, is terrible. There's probably only one really good basketball movie, and that's Hoosiers. Uh, Beyond that, there's not many great basketball movies. There are a lot of great baseball movies. Football also doesn't have a lot of good ones. Here are some of the ones that are listed. I just want to bring it up. One of the best, this is in the top 10, The Water Boy. (laughs) Adam Sandler's The Water Boy, which is not really a football movie. It's a movie about that guy. Like, it's a comedy about that guy. Do y'all remember The Replacements with Keanu Reeves, one of Gene Hackman's last movies? It's a funny yeah. movie. It's a fun movie. Not a great football movie. Any Given Sunday, uh, I do not like that movie. I do not find it enjoyable. That's an Oliver Stone movie. If you haven't seen it, I would not suggest it. Varsity Blues, also not a fan. I know a lot of people who are not a fan. So I, I, are, are, Can we just declare it? Best football movie of all time, Remember the Titans. Yeah. yeah. Don, Donnie's going with it too. Yeah, all by right. far. So I think, and here, so here's what I'll throw up to just as we're kind of ending up our talk about the movie itself. My kids watch this movie and they've seen it twice and they love it. Uh, so if you've got young kids, this is a great one. And in particular to the themes that we want to talk about today of with uh, Martin Luther King Day coming up and uh, your kids are going to have it off from school and they may go, why do we have this day off from school? And you're not sure what, you know, how to talk about it because what I have found, and this is what I have found, is that particularly for white Americans, I can only speak to that experience, talking about the civil rights movement uh, feels tricky to many people. And most of the time, you feel like you either end up kind of dismissing what happened and, well, let's just not talk about it. Let's, you know, we, we've moved past it and it's all good. Or you feel like this immense amount of like, guilt if you want to talk about what what went on and then there's just this mixture that's all in between and what i think this movie does well and what it will allow us to do is this movie is a fairly positive spin on what it looks like for a community of people to really choose to love and care and honor one another um Dis, not, I wouldn't even say despite race because of race like they they, yeah. they don't s- choose to ignore the differences in race but they choose to say let's allow that tension to actually bring us together not to separate us Donnie yeah. I can see you want to, are, are you agreeing with that I definitely agree because I mean there was there were definitely plenty of scenes where you see these moments that are really very tense and then I think the one that comes to mind is the one with the police officer when he's pulling up to, I think it's to uh, Boone's house and you think it's about to be like a really tense moment. And he's like, good job. Good job on the game. And like, or it's like, uh, yes, we're, we're, we're ready to, you know, back you a hundred percent. And that moment is so well done because it shows that that is happening. But people are saying, you know what? I can either be against or I can, go with this and we can be do this as a community, which I thought was great. I agree. And I think what this allows us to do, I think this movie is a great opportunity for us. And I, I really do believe that we should honor Dr. King on this holiday uh, with our families. But here's how I would encourage you to do it. Um, I would not, when your kids ask, so why do we get this holiday off? I would not start with, there was a great American named Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And he did this for our country. I would start by, there was a follower of Jesus and he was a pastor and he lived in America. And there were problems in our country because people of different ethnicities, those who were in power all looked one way. They all had the same skin color and they they were able to keep things in power on their own and they did not help people who are underneath. But Dr. King, because he followed Jesus, knew that that was not the way God wanted it to be. And so he led a movement of people and there were lots of Christians that were involved in that movement to to reclaim this as not an American project but as a kingdom of God project, as a group of churches and believers who chose to say, Jesus, Jesus' desire is to see all people, no matter their ethnicity, their nationality, their gender, how much money they make, where they come from, what language they speak, all of those things that kind of trip us up and divide us. His view 
Jesus' goal, his, his heart, why he died on the cross was that all humanity would be united in their love for God. And so certainly those of us who follow Jesus should do that. Dr. King wanted that to happen, and that's why he led his movement. Donnie, do you have anything to, to, to add to that on talking to, to, to your kids about the life of Dr. King? I mean, I think that's, I mean, I think what you said was well said. I mean, because I think the it's a very key por- portion of it because I think we don't want to shy away from all of the the high points of it. You know, like you said, he was a Christ follower. He was a pastor. Like he led with the idea of following Jesus's example. And I right. think that's a, a very big, big point because at the end of the day, what he did change the course of how life was done and how people were treated, you know, in the United States, regardless of what you looked like and where you came from. And so that holiday, when kids go and look at it, it should be remembered as not just this guy that did some things, but a Christ follower that did what Jesus, what Jesus asked of us. And that's to go into the world you know, and show love because people will know you are my disciples by how you love. And he showed that. And that's a great example. Yeah. Well, and he did it in the midst of, and so this brings it back to the movie here. Cause one coach Boone, they say at one point, and it's kind of a throwaway line, but it's important to the characters that he marched with Dr. King. So like, it's clear that Denzel Washington's character is mixed up in the civil rights movement. Like he is, he is all a part of it. He is, he is moving this ball forward. But what you see in this movie and really what Dr. King wanted to happen was that it would go beyond stop treating people badly because of their race to let's become a community of people who love one another because of what makes us um, not just because of what makes us different, but because of the love of Jesus that's at the center. And I think that's the difference that you, as we talk about here a lot, is you have to go beyond the conversation. This movie yep. uh, is not made by believers. So their their goal is, you know, it's football that can bring you together or a common goal can bring you together. Something like that. I think all those things are good and fine. But as believers, we have to say the thing that unites us is not a common goal. It's Jesus. That yep. Jesus will ultimately unite us that it's okay for us to say to our kids your whole life there will always be something that people want to divide over and maybe it's race and ethnicity maybe it's politics we see that in our world a lot right now maybe it's just opinions they certainly see that in their school they see in their school that kids sit at this table and sit at this table and maybe it's ethnicity maybe it's money maybe it's just i do this sport and you do that you know whatever it is And that what should ultimately be the thing that unites us all in love is that Jesus Christ died for humanity to reconcile us both to God, to make our relationship with God right, but to create a, what Dr. King eventually would call a beloved community, a people who are united in love. And for us to be able to talk about that with our kids, um, does anyone else have anything to kind of add on, on this idea of Dr. King's life and his work and how to talk about that? All right. Well, I want to take this even one step further because I think this is an opportunity for us as parents to go even beyond just Dr. King. And I think he himself, as a believer and as a pastor, as a leader of a church, would want this to not be something where we would look at Dr. King and say, wow, what a great man, but to go beyond him to see Jesus, to go beyond him to see, oh, look at the heart of Jesus for all people. And that that would be something that would unite us closer to one another in the church. Because as I was talking about, I read a book maybe a year and a half ago. I believe the name of the book is The Beloved Community. And it's a book about the theology of the different groups in the civil rights movement. It's sometimes we, we forget Dr. King was not over the entire civil rights movement. He was over a certain group of people that were leading, but there were lots of different groups, including one that I've talked about before, Koinonia Farms, that is here. They're mentioned in the book. Uh, SNCC, which is uh, the, I think it's Southern Nonviolent Christian 
something like that. I can't remember exactly what it is, but like uh, it, it, many people know John Lewis was a part of that. He was one of the leaders of that movement. And the book goes into what were the beliefs? Cause these are all Christian organizations. Now, not all civil rights movements were Christian organizations, but these that were kind of led by the Southern uh, Christian leadership uh, council, which Dr. King was ahead of these all kind of united together under the love of Jesus. And when they talked about Dr. King's theology, one of the central things was beloved community, that he believed in particular that God's goal, and this was primarily through the church, but that the church could do this for other people, is to create a community in which everyone is cared for, that they are absent of poverty, hunger, and hate, that these things of poverty, hunger, and hate are the enemies of a beloved community. And that he believed that Jesus was working through the church to make this happen, but that the church could extend this to people who aren't even believers. That we could make sure that in our country, uh, that everyone was able to be loved and not hated. That everyone could be uh, fed, that people could be taken care of no matter how much money they have. And so for us to be able to talk about to our kids, how do we as a church, become the kind of place like this football team. And there's a particular scene that I want to talk about, and then I want to toss it to my co-host, where at the big, you know, the, I, I thought there wasn't a halftime speech in this movie. I thought we were going to get, I was like, oh, I, maybe this movie doesn't have a halftime speech. But then there is one. It's a pretty darn good one, where they've had a perfect season, and they're about to lose the game. And Julius steps up. He's played by Wood Harris uh, in an all-star performance. Also, he's in both Creed and Creed Two in all-star performances. I'll just say that. Uh, but he says at one point, hey, I'm not perfect and none of us are perfect. No one ever will be. He says, but this team is perfect. And that somehow imperfect people can join together to create something that is beautiful and perfect and what Jesus would call beloved. Um, and that we could say to our kids, hey, that's probably not going to happen with a football team or even at your school. And it may never happen in our country that all people come together in love and we always may face division in our country. But it could happen in the church. It could happen in the church that we could be a place where all people can love one another uh, in the love of Jesus. So can we talk about how to have that conversation with our kids? Does someone want to talk about how do we start talking to them about the church being our primary place of creating this beloved community? Yeah, I, I definitely, I mean, I'll just, I'll use a scene from the movie. Um, the team captain is Gary. And before he gets in his car accident, it takes him out for the rest of his life. It paralyzes him before that happens. He, you know, his best friend in all of football growing up was this guy named Ray. And what Gary starts to realize is that Ray is not, is like holding the team back. Not because the team is like, is going to like just lose all the time because of Ray, but because Ray is, does not love everyone on the team. Ray actively dislikes his black team members. And, and in particular does not do his job because he will not protect uh, yes. his, uh, the black quarterback, uh, yes. Rev. Ray is, Ray is on the O-line is the thing. And he intentionally misses a blocking assignment so that Re Rev gets injured, is, which, which causes Rev to get injured. And there's a level to which the courage that Gary has in that moment to say, okay, we're done then. That is kind of like what I think about when I think of, oh, that's the church. That's what the church is supposed to be like. It's supposed to repel hate. And it's supposed to like eject hate and it's supposed to bring in love. And that's, there's a level to which like when I watched that scene, you know, as a kid, I was like, oh yeah, get rid of him. And now I'm like, oh gosh, like I actually sympathize with Gary even more now as an adult, knowing what he's going through in that moment. Like as a kid, I was like, yeah, Gary's like stepping up to the plate and he's leading as, as an adult. I'm like, he's like rejecting a person that he loves because he knows that it will be better for the community at large. And there's a level to which I think that is like the more courageous thing that goes on is the expulsion of the hater is the thing. And so well, that is. And to, 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 to add on to what you're saying, I said to my kids, I said, cause I've made pretty clear early. I do this a lot. I try to like make the metaphors clear for them. Like, I'm like, I want you to think about this football team, like the church, a group of people who have the same goal. We want to create this community 
but we're going to have people who are completely different, people who are black, people who are white, people who are rich, people who are poor, people who, who vote different, all that kind of stuff. And I said, and everyone gets to be included. And they said, well, why doesn't that guy get to be included? I said, mm-hmm. well, you know, the Apostle Paul talks about this, that if you have a divisive person, if you have a person who is trying to create two teams within the one team, you are to expel that person from your midst because the community, this beloved community, if you have a person who refuses to love a brother, refuses to love a sister, then it, it what is right for you is to go to them. And we get the example of Paul going to Peter at one point. Paul goes to Peter and says, Peter, when, when, when the Jewish Christians aren't around, you eat with the Gentile Christians all the time. And he's talking about ethnicity. He's saying you eat with people who are not ethnically Jewish all the time. But then when the people from Jerusalem show up, when, when your fellow Jews show up, you won't even eat with the Gentile Christians. He says, you're being divisive. You got to fix that. And it's this moment of, like you said, it's a, what we would call a come to Jesus moment in youth group. Mm-hmm. I got to sit down with this person and be like, look, you got to figure this out. And you're right. And that's why I said to them, I said, part of our job, and I'll just say in particular, in a church that is uh, percentagely primarily white, I said to my daughters, I said, you always need to be willing to say to other white believers, hey, this is not okay. That, that joke you just made, this comment you just made, this way you don't, you only talk to people who look like you, that's not acceptable. That someone has to be willing to be the one to step up to the plate. That that's, you you create a beloved community with hard conversations. And I think that's important. Donnie, you mentioned something, I want to toss it to you here. You had talked about one theme in this movie, which I think really kind of goes together here, is this idea of who is my brother. And I think in particular of, The only way for us to become a beloved community is for me to look at someone who before I might have considered an enemy or just someone I didn't want to be associated with. Um, I would call them a brother or sister. And I think the scene that really I I don't know if this is the scene you're talking about, but I want to kind of pitch it to you to kind of take Mm -hmm. this is the scene where Wood Harris's character Julius shows up in the hospital after Gary Bertier has been. Uh, par- hit by the car, he's paralyzed, and the nurse says, "Oh, I'm sorry, only family is allowed." And he says, "Can't you see the resemblance? That's my brother." Yeah. And that moment is really—I don't know if that's the moment you were talking about, but that's a powerful moment. You want to talk about that? So, like, I mean, definitely, that was definitely a big, powerful moment. Um, one of the moments I was thinking about particularly was um, when they're in the lunchroom, um, and if you remember, Louis, like he's a. Uh, like he's this guy that he enters this room and he doesn't see what everybody else looks like. He doesn't go, Hey, you, you know, I'm supposed to sit over here with these guys because they look like me or I'm supposed to sit with them. Like Louie is like, I don't care who you are. If you love a good song or like he, like they start singing, they start doing all these things. And I love because Louie's perspective, it seems as if it's like Louie walks into the room. He goes, I don't see anything but brothers. It's like, right. cause we are here to do a singular job and I don't care about any of the other little silly things because I really love how Boone takes them and he says, look, y'all are going to learn about each other. Y'all are going to spend yes. time with one another. Y'all are going to share with one another because it goes back to the idea of what Jesus called us to do is we're supposed to share in each other's sad moments, our happiest moments, our, our grief, our, like all of those emotions, because that's what helps us to grow together. Because, you know, a lot of people are like, well, the family bond is the people that, you know, you were born with, but that's not true. Like, because there are closer bonds that I have to people that are not blood relatives. And that's what we are as Christ followers is that we are all called to be part of the kingdom of God in that family. And when Donnie, we walk into I, I'm not interrupting you, but I just, I got, this is a good preacher moment. We may not be <laughs> blood relatives, but we relatives in the blood of Christ. <laughs> I like it. I like it. I like it. I like it. That'll preach. That'll preach. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead though. I think you're right. Yeah. But it's, but it's so true because I think when you get, like it's the the term, like, you know, you get lost in the sauce, you forget what's going on and you forget what the, the purpose of the thing is, because sometimes you, you show up to something and you're like, Hey, this is what I expect. We're going to do this like this. And then, well, your brother in Christ says, 
well, from my experience, that hasn't worked. Can we try something different? And we we come together. We we look at it and go, you know what? You're not my enemy. You're you're on the same team. And I think that's a big part because being brothers and sisters in Christ is not always agreeing at on the exact thing, but agreeing on the one thing, and that's Jesus yes. and the mission of what we're supposed to do. Because are we going to want to do it all the same way? No. But at the end of the day, are we propelling God's word along to other people and helping others to see what Christ's love looks like? And that's like, and that's the biggest part of it. Well, Donnie, that's kind of where I want to wrap up here. Uh, Just kind of with you as the final word on that, because I think that's right. I think the, the goal of, Christian community is to resemble heaven, that we are to become what Dr. King would call the beloved community, as we've said, that we are to become a group of people that no matter uh, our differences, and Louis a great example because Louis not one of those guys, like you said, he says, I see brothers, but he doesn't, he doesn't do one of those things of, oh, we're all the same, because he's in there singing these like Motown songs with them where all the other guys are singing country Western songs, and like he's able to kind of be like, I see your culture, I see what makes you different, and I see it as beautiful. I see yeah. it as, we're going to add something to one another, that there is something about um, the the about Jesus, I would even say about the body of Christ that is incomplete when it only looks like one culture or, 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 or one skin color or one hair texture or one, whatever you want to say, like any of those things when there's something that's incomplete. And I think this movie does that. And I think you said the right thing. And so I wanted to say that as part of our more than a conversation with your kids, I think teaching your kids skills and practices is important. And I think really what Coach Boone does in this movie is the thing that believers have to do, which is to move to the other. So if I am if I am a white person, I'm a white man, for me to walk into a room and it'd be all different kinds of people, for me to walk over to another white man and go, hey, let's build a friendship. It's not that there's anything wrong with that. It's that the way of Jesus teaches me to go to who is different than me and how do I include the stranger? How do I include the foreigner? How do I include the other and make, like you said, people who might be in the world's eyes considered my enemies into my family? And uh, the earth, you know, there's this word that gets thrown around a lot of xenophilia, which is the fear of, I'm sorry, xenophobia. I said it backwards. Xenophobia is the fear of the other that we we talk about that a lot that you're xenophobic you're afraid of people who are different than you what is unique about the church is that in the old greek uh they would talk about the church as being xenophiliacs that they were people who loved people who were different they intentionally moved to people who were different so to be able to say to your kid hey at school is there anyone in your class who doesn't look like you why don't you go try and be friends with them you know at your and especially at church when you're at church do you see someone and they have a different skin tone than you Could you try and include them? Could you try and be friends with them? Hey, I know you're a boy and at this age, girls are icky or, you know, you're a girl and boys are icky. Could you try and get to know some of the boys or some of the girls? Like, could you try to make sure everybody gets to be included? That's a skill set you can teach your kids that will help them and teach them. The reason we do this is because this is what Jesus did for us. And I think this movie is a good example of, hey, what's one thing you learned about someone today that you didn't know yesterday? You know, when you send your kid to school, what's something you learned about someone you didn't know? Did you meet? We used to say to our girls when they first moved in, learn someone's name every day. Learn someone new just so that they got in the practice of talking to people they didn't know. So I think those are all really good things. I want to wrap up because we're actually done a little bit early. uh, And I just want to wrap up with everyone's favorite moment from the movie. This movie has incredible moments. I've already said mine off. Uh, the podcast, so I'll say it here. My favorite moment is that moment when Rev gets taken out, and this is this is previous to the moment Sawyer's talking about, where um, Ray lets this really aggressive, like tough, like he's like the 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 meanest defensive guy come in and tackle Rev, right? Who is the black quarterback? He gets taken out. He's injured. He can't come back. And they send Sunshine in, who's kind of considered this soft hippie California kid to be the quarterback. And he says, let him through again. And when they let him through, he just kind of bends over and makes the guy get just bulldoze himself down. It's like a judo move. Like he uses his energy against him and knocks the dude down. And it is like this moment of like the team coming together. That's my moment right there. I love that movie every time. 
to, to that scene's credit, I think that my favorite detail right there is at the end of the play, Sunshine just like stares down at him. Oh, it yeah. literally feels like you're watching an NFL game where a quarterback just broke a guy's ankles and he's just like staring at him on the ground. It's that's a great scene. It's this great uh, moment of like unity of, Hey, I'm standing up for my brother and we're, we're coming together. It's yeah. a great moment, but it's just, and it's a cool football moment. So yeah. Sawyer, my, what's your favorite moment? My favorite moment is definitely. So near the beginning of the movie, they're all getting ready to go to their football camp and like, they're gonna, I know, like you gotta say this, this is my favorite part of the moment. This is my favorite part of the movie. Okay. And coach B- and, uh, so Gary and the guy who's going to get cut later on Ray, they walk up to coach Boone to basically say, Hey, you, we don't, he's, I think he actually says the line. Says, we, we don't, don't need, a, we don't need any of your people on, yes. on defense. And I'll ne- like, like, I'll never forget the first time I saw this movie. I was laugh or this moment. I was like laughing as a little kid. And now like, I still laugh, but I'm also like, Oh, this is awesome. And basically what he does is he, he, he like leans in close. He's like, and he like, he's like, who's your daddy? He's like, you got to say who your daddy is, Gary, before anything happens. You got to say who's who your daddy, daddy on this team, Gary. Who's okay. your daddy? And, oh, and before that, he also, he like points out that they're like, dre- they're like acting like kind of like comedians. He's like, this is hilarious that this is happening. And so he calls all the parents who are dropping off their kids. And he's like, everyone, ladies and gentlemen. And he like embarrasses them. He like calls them Jerry Lewis. And um, who's the other guy that he, he calls Dean Ray? Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis. Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis. Okay. And like, and then he's like, you have to say who your daddy is if you're going to get on the bus. And it's just, it's just a perfect it's awesome. scene. My it's girls so love that good. moment. That's so good. <laughs> All right, Donnie, wrapping us up here. What's your favorite moment in the movie? I think my favorite moment was when they were coming on the field and they did that little dance uh, oh. as a unified mm. like team. We them are coming the out. Titan. <laughs> yes, I love them coming out there because that that unified moment where they were like, we're going to let everyone know we are on the same page and we are here as a collective unit. So as a collective unit, we are strong. And yes. you will not like topple us. And I love that because it was just, it was such a, it could be such a throwaway moment, but it, it sets the stage for everything. Well, Donnie, so. you just gave me my wrap up moment here. Cause I mean, come on, there's nothing better than this. So that moment's awesome because they end up using humor. I mean, they look silly coming out. That's not yeah. a football team does. They come out looking silly. And what, what, what Paul, when he ends up writing to the church, he describes what Jesus did on the cross as shaming in the way that a comedian would shame the powers of hate and evil and sin that hate and evil and sin and the empires of this world through death at Jesus. And he literally just like walked it off. He walked, he was like, he was like, you knocked me down. I walked it off three days later. And it's like this comedic moment. And what churches have done throughout history and especially oppressive places is to know we're going to look foolish. Following the way of Jesus will look like a comedy act. It'll look foolish. This team, these people who are poor and begging and they're sick and they're, and they, they, they're, they're not the same skin tone. They don't come from the same place. They're going to be the most united, loving place. And they're broken and they're sinful and all these things. And somehow through coming out in that moment, uh, they, they, they come out with this humor and this lightheartedness to be like, everything you're throwing at us, it's a joke. It's a joke. In fact, one of my favorite moments in the movie is after this incredibly despicable racist comment one of the coaches makes. I won't get to it, but people know what it is. Coach Boone at the end of the movie comes up and shows it at the end of the game, hands him a banana. If you remember that moment in the same way, it's like, I'm not returning your hate with hate. I'm going to, I'm going to return it back and be like, okay, man, well, you're better than this. Let's move on. You know? Yeah. And that's just this incredible moment. And I think this movie's full of those things and it's a great opportunity to talk to your kids how to help our church, Community Christian, and really the church all across the world become a beloved community where all people are loved in the name of Jesus. Uh, and so we hope you do that and that uh, we'll see you next week as we continue to talk about how to help your children love Jesus and his way of life even more. We'll see you then.